DIDX offers communication companies to offer DID phone numbers from around the world. DIDX has numbers from over 60 countries and over 9,000 cities with instant activation and low monthly rates. These numbers can be used for calling card, VoIP, callback, call forwarding, PBXs, mobile phones, voicemail, faxing or any other voice service you can think of. Numbers are also available on per channel, per minute and per trigger basis. In addition, you will be provided with two free numbers to test the compatibility and interconnection with your switch. All buying is done through your own website, with DIDX running transparently in the background. Provisioning the phone numbers through your server over SIP. Our API and web service will empower you to integrate entire DIDX inventory of numbers on your website, enabling your site to have millions of phone number choices instantly. Your company gains an excellent reputation with increased revenue, more satisfied customers and a global presence. Try out today and see what over 20,000 companies have already discovered. DIDX.net So thank you Dr. for um, meeting us and giving us the time, knowing us, doing you more. Um, tell us more about you, your childhood, where were you born, how many siblings did you have, what kind of household did you grow up in, what did your father do, what did your mother do? <laughs> then let me take you back <laughs> to when I was born as a little boy, a baby obviously, in England. And I lived on the south side of London by the River Thames, a little area called Walton on Thames and Shepperton. And my first memories were when I was two years old. And I remember in the house <clears throat> going behind the large curtains, press my nose you know, against the glass and look up into the sky. And coming over the sky were aeroplanes and I could hear that fabulous sound look at them all and then I'd hear a sound and it would stop and then it would be <laughs> and I was born in a war and you know I was two I didn't know it was a war I just saw all these amazing things called aeroplanes bombers. I heard this beautiful sound and when it stopped it was a missile <laughs> that stopped and boom and one of those bombs my my front door in my house was blown in and it was made of glass so there was and it was thick beautiful you know like the glasses in temples thick colored glass <clears throat> And I remember I was two, and it was fascinating. You know, I didn't know that that was bad or wrong, it was just beautiful. And I went down and I know that as I saw the glass, I wanted to touch it. And so I did. And my two-year-old little hand picked up colored glass with amazingly sharp edges. But the natural intelligence of a baby, which is what I really was, knows what to do. It knew that it was sharp. And I was holding this broken glass, loving it, and put it down. No blood, nothing. And that was when I was two. And so as a little boy, obviously the, the war ended when I was three. I was born in 1942 and I just walked out of my house and wandered around and I fell in love with nature. So my passion, my almost a fixation was the beauty and the magic of nature and animals and insects and birds and butterflies and everything that I saw 
I was amazed at. You know, I'd see a butterfly and I'd wonder, how could that fly? How could it direct itself? How is it so beautifully colored? I'd watch birds and I could, I could not understand how they knew how to fly. <laughs> you know, there was a, a flock of birds and there were thousands of them and they were going <laughs> and none of them crashed into each other. So I began to realize that they were actually intelligent. They weren't just dumb bird brains. They were bird brains who could do these extraordinary things and they could communicate with each other. So as a little boy, I fell in love with nature and that became the bulk of my life. That was London or that was north of... Okay. That, w that was in the southern area and then on the coast of England, uh, near Canterbury, a little town called Whitstable which is a fishing village. So I came from the river area on the south of London into the, the river estuary of the River Thames and I lived there as well. And nature was my interest and friendship was my interest. And my best friend, a little boy called Barry, um, we couldn't wait to get out of school. <laughs> we didn't hate school but you know we were more interested in nature and getting out there and being physical and active and so we used to collect animals we belonged to the protection for animals and insects and bird societies um, we bred them we never killed them we found it difficult to understand why other kids would try and kill birds or little animals. And partly I began to understand that those little boys were themselves hurt. You know, they were in pain. Um, and so it was you know, to, to get rid of their pain. But they actually did love animals. And you'd see children who had not appreciated animals, who fell in love with a dog and it became the focus of their kindness, their generosity, their attendant to the needs of the animal. So that's how I started. As a little boy who loved nature, couldn't understand the destruction of it, and wasn't particularly interested in school, and school became more informative and shifted my thought about what life really was. What did your father do? What my father? My father was trained as an electrical engineer. Um, but he was a daydreamer. And he had as a hobby both listening to music and changing houses and lighting things. So, as my father, you know, when I was seven, he wanted to buy a new house. Why a new house? Because it was a derelict. <laughs> it was falling apart, there were gaps in the ceiling, and he'd buy that, which was almost nothing. And he'd take a chair, and he would sit in one of the rooms, and he'd just sit and look at this room and he'd then move to another room and he'd sit in the middle of another room and he'd just look around and daydream about it and he'd do that for a day or two or three just sitting in a derelict and then he'd say to mum I've got it <laughs> I've got it and within a few weeks that house would begin to be rebuilt and he would think, he would imagine a fireplace would be there, an alcove would be here, windows could be here so we could see that vista. And then he thought light changes every shape and every room. So he would design the lighting 
So as a little boy, I would go into the living room and there was a little panel of lights and I could change that room into a green room, into a purple room. With your imagination? Really, really, I could just do that because my father had given me that toy and I could listen to music in that room, in those colors, daydreaming myself. And he could darken it so you could go into the room and it would be almost midnight but not quite. And he put stars in the ceiling. So you could just <laughs> look at the stars that he put there. So my father was a daydreamer, an electrical engineer, a lover of listening especially to classical music and choir singing. Um, so things like Handel's Messiah, he would listen to that day in and day out as he imagined and daydreamed. So that was my, my dad. So was it like a full-time job for him to go out from 9 o'clock to 4 o'clock or was he around fixing the house more? No, his time was the time that he tended to manage. You know, even if he suddenly thought, well, I need some money, he would go and sell hoovers or whatever um, to give him the energy to go and build another house and relight it. And in his senior years, he became fascinated with the clothes that people wore. You know, and he'd look at the shape of a lady, the shape of a man, and he'd start to design clothes because it was, again, a vision and the texture of the materials. And his main focus, which he then became you know, a known businessman, was to light the astronomical observatories, both inside and outside. And he was one of the first in history to change the shape of a building when you looked at it. He could change the shape of it just by the lights. So you'd think that this building was kind of flattish, but zoom, it would warp. <laughs> you know, like if anybody's a Star Trek, or like a Klingon spaceship kind of warps into view. He could do that with, uh, with light. He played with light. And your siblings, how many did you have? I had one younger brother. My mother had two miscarriages after me and I was told later by my mum that she was told after me and then two miscarriages she was told by the doctors don't have another child don't try for another child my mother was persistent and <laughs> she decided I want to try again and sure enough my brother Professor Barry Buzan. He wasn't Professor Barry Buzan when he was born. But the wonderful thing that my mum and dad did was they were obviously concerned that I might be jealous. Um, you know, there could be fighting between two children. And they said to me, right from the time that my baby was conceived, first of all, they let me touch mummy's tummy when he was beginning to kick. And then they said, son, this baby is yours. It's a present for you. A present. And I thought, how oh, wonderful. I'm going to have a present. It's mine. And when he was born in swaddling clothes, what did they do? They gave him to me. They said, this is yours. How old were you? I was three and a half. And so I... had a baby at three and a half? I, baby at three and a half. 
and he was mine. And what was wonderful about that was that I couldn't be jealous. I mean, how can you be jealous of your present? So he was mine. So obviously I loved him and I cared for him. He was my present, my gift, which in fact he was, and he still is. What, what is he a professor of? My brother became a professor of international relations. And he, he was fascinated by the interrelations of nations and city-states and states and countries and groups. How do they relate to each other? And what are the ways of helping them develop their global thinking, if you like, to make the state a more real, a more useful entity. And that was his study and still is. And he has written book after book after book on it. He is fascinated by the way we as human beings in nation states function and what are the best ways to develop ourselves. After, my brother. <laughs> after studying minds for almost 50 years, almost 50 years I would say, mm -hmm. maybe more, why do you think that reptilian brain, which we have all have, have takes over sometimes? And like especially when we are younger, it's more active or is it, or is it when you get older, is it still active as the same amount? Yes, there, there is an assumption that animals are dumb, uh, that they don't have emotions, they don't care, they're not particularly bright, and the worst of them all are the reptiles. And that's often considered to be a negative term. And then in the development of the human brain, the, the first part of the brain is considered to be reptilian. And reptilian is not thought of as good and so we have a reptilian brain and therefore we behave like reptiles and we don't think and we don't feel and we don't care and that is the spreading of dangerous misinformation. Reptiles are not the way they are described. Reptiles are very intelligent and what do they do? They look after their children. They bring them forth and they look after them and they defend them and they get angry and they feel pain and they try to adjust to survive well. Is that okay for a human being? Yes it is. So we don't have a reptile brain. We have a phenomenal brain as does the reptile, as does the dog, which is brilliant, as does the spider. The spider has a phenomenal brain. A tiny little miniature jumping spider can see, can think, can count, can calculate, can plan, can anticipate, can image. We live in a much more amazing world than we think we live in. You know, people say, oh, flies, you know, oh, you know, bees, spiders, reptiles, whatever. And they should be saying, look at those. Look at those flies. How do they do that? How do the birds do that? How is it that reptiles, which are supposed to be aggressive, violent, unemotional, etc. How can they bring up children? Which they obviously can. So we, um, we live in a much more beautiful world and the animals are much more interesting, far more intelligent, far more sensitive, 
than people think, or people don't think. <laughs> Do you personally think that there are different kinds of evolutionary stage that nations are you travel the obviously the around 70 countries of the world, 75 countries of the world? You meet people in Turkey, you meet people in Japan, you meet people in the US, you meet people in the UK. People say Japanese are much more evolved than the people in maybe India and Pakistan, maybe. But as you say, humans are humans everywhere. Yes. However, the evolutionary stage of learning might be different. I mean, 60 years ago, where you were living was nothing. It was flattened by bombs and there was literally nothing. And yes. it just grew back everywhere. Now it's one of the peacefulest cities in the world. To be the countries which are in a similar stage, or the cities which are in the similar stage of where London was in 1945, what is the difference in learning for them, for their brain, that they are not able to evolve and keep, keep fighting among themselves? And which, which I, what mm. I was referring to on the reptilian side, like for example, the, the people think that there is not enough maybe, and then they go out and become reptilian and try to protect their territory. Or like a lion, or like a whale, or like a human being, protecting the territory. But if you see a more different country like Finland or Sweden, where mm. people are more giving, at least it looks like that, that when you reach that level of evolution, human growth, even though they're the same human beings, same brains, same processor, but they are acting differently with the world than the rest of the world. What's the difference? What did you find? Because that always makes me think on those lines that, you know, why are they acting in a different way? Why aren't they fighting like crazy? Why does Swiss, Switzerland doesn't have an army, whereas, you know, countries like ours spend 60 to 70 percent on the army, you know, so that sounds like we're in a country like ours, for example, where we don't have clean drinking water, we spend 70 percent on the, on fighting. Why hmm. is that? Why is that? It's it's evolution, and people think, you know, it's been for so long, but it's been hardly any time at all. Exactly. You know, biologically, the human brain has been around for a very, very few years, and there it is, and it's got all these things that it has to do, it's got to obviously live, it has to eat, it has to reproduce, it has to defend, it has to be sheltered from the environment. And it's only a few years. I mean, the, the actual location of the human brain is in the head. That's where it's primarily based. You know, when you take it out, the rest of the system doesn't work so well. So the, the central nervous system is encased in the human head. And everybody has one. And when it was located, how long would you think, when do you think the world accepted the fact that the brain was in the head? No idea. Maybe 200 years, maybe less? Yeah. It, it was assumed that everybody knew it all the time. But they didn't. It was everything was related to heart. Exactly. They thought the brain was here. Why? Lots of good evidence. You know, if something gets stuck through it, finished. If something gets stuck through here, could be finished, but maybe not. Maybe, you know, just a little bit strange. So everybody thought that the brain was here. Even the great Greek thinkers like Aristotle thought that the brain was here. And that was 2,000 years ago. And so a very few hundred years ago, the planet began to realize, we began to, people began to realize that the brain was here. But even in 1968, psychologists, and I was studying, were saying, well, you know, stuff comes in one ear and goes out the other, and the brain is like a black box. <laughs> you know? It's a simple thing. 
and you just put stuff in and stuff goes out. Within a few years, people began to realize that the brain was actually much more interesting, not a black box, complex. And now, just now, the world is beginning to realize that every brain has millions and hundreds of millions and thousands and millions of millions of brain cells. And people thought it was just a brain cell. But a brain cell is more powerful than a standard computer, a PC. That single brain cell can do the most phenomenal things. We've got a million million. So it's much more precious. And therefore more people are beginning to realize it's more precious. People who want to fight and realize that they get hit in the head and get concussion. They're damaging their own biocomputer. And people become a lot more concerned about getting hit. And they become more concerned about hitting somebody else because they realize that they are smashing something that is precious and that they have one. So the violence becomes very different, different perspectives. So nations, and not just nations, but groups or tribes or gangs, whatever they are, <clears throat> who begin to fight are tending to do it actually less. And when you hear that nations <clears throat> are all fighting, they're not. You know, take Pakistan. 180 million. 180 million people. How many every day are fighting? Hardly any of them. Human beings are fundamentally very peaceful animals. You, know, you watch human beings with their families and fundamentally it's all in caring, <clears throat> in trying to protect them. And if one of them starts to irritate the others, you know, <laughs> whatever, blah, 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 calms down. As long as they are knowledgeable and educated and have food and have friendship and connection and have education. And evolutionarily, the world is evolving. You know, the nations, fine, you know, England, Ireland, Scotland, Wales, America, Brazil, Mexico, Germany, Italy, China, Japan, whatever. But they're all being composed of citizens who are becoming increasingly aware. So the, the revolutions in the human race, you know, the, the agricultural age, 10,000 years. And after that, the industrial age, a couple of hundred years. After that, the information age, quite recently. This is the evolution. And then they suddenly realize too much information, you know, overdose. So the knowledge age, very recent the knowledge age and people beginning to want to learn. And I've traveled to 75 countries, all the children in all the countries and all the parents, all the people basically want to learn. Even if it just means being a good chef, everybody wants to learn. So knowledge is important and people were saying knowledge is power. That's not really what it's all about. What it's about is how do you use the knowledge. So the age we are now evolving into is the age of managing the manager of knowledge. And what is the manager of knowledge? A manager of knowledge is the brain. It manages or it badly manages, it mismanages. And it only mismanages when it doesn't know how to manage. So we are now entering the dawn of an age which is the intelligence age, where people are all beginning to think intelligently, thinking intelligently about agriculture and the production of good nutrition. They are thinking more intelligently and more than thinking intelligently about industry. How do we use that? more intelligent about information and about technology. You know, how do we use technology? Many people are thinking technology is dangerous and rots the brain, etc. It can, 
and it can spread information. It can help people like us communicate. So intelligently used technology is wonderful. And then you have knowledge. You, know, you can have knowledge and power and whatever, but the information age now gives knowledge all over the place. So what's more important than all of that? The intelligent use of it. So we are now in the opening of the age of intelligence. And most importantly, intelligence will be thought about intelligently. So finally we will think intelligently about everything. And when the globe is thinking intelligently, it becomes an intelligent global brain. And that's where people are going. That's where the nations are heading. So there is, if you like, a super state now being created. And it's a super state of intelligence and intelligent beings who learn how to learn. And school, rather than now teaching people, you know, just history or chemistry or biology and all the lists of whatever, people will learn about learning and they will learn how to think and they will learn how to remember, they will learn how to create, they will learn how to communicate. That's a utopian vision, isn't it? That's paradise. And is it possible? Very, very possible. And it's beginning to grow. DIDX offers communication companies to offer DID phone numbers from around the world. DIDX has numbers from over 60 countries and over 9,000 cities with instant activation and low monthly rates. These numbers can be used for calling card, VoIP, callback, call forwarding, PBXs, mobile phones, voicemail, faxing or any other voice service you can think of. Numbers are also available on per channel, per minute and per trigger basis. In addition, you will be provided with two free numbers to test the compatibility and interconnection with your switch. All buying is done through your own website with DIDX running transparently in the background, provisioning the phone numbers through your server over SIP. Our API and web service will empower you to integrate entire DIDX inventory of numbers on your website, enabling your site to have millions of phone number choices instantly. Your company gains an excellent reputation with increased revenue, more satisfied customers and a global presence. Try out today and see what over 20,000 companies have already discovered. DIDX.net